Hi everyone, welcome to Casual Watch Talk Sunday Social. Welcome to the panel. So it should be an interesting show. I say that every week. It'll be a very interesting show this week, I'm sure, because it, we're talking about the worst watches of Wonders predictions, a few of our own, and maybe what we think might be likely. But before we do that, we've got a full panel, so let's do the all-important wish watch check. Wristwatch? Wristwatch. 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 Todd, say go, Todd. Save me. <laughs> what are you wearing? Oh, I'll save you. Um, here we go. I can get off my wrist. So a little different today. Uh, we'll wear this to, uh, to church, but this is... There we oh. go. In something decent here. I'm still working on this. Get a focus. There we go. Maybe there somewhere go. right right around here. Gerard Perigo. Um, oh, nice. Uh, chronograph. This is like a little bit of a 90s fling here. It's hard to see, but this is a two-tone case. So it's got a okay. gold rim around uh, around this piece here and that sort of thing. So um, it's interesting, too. They put a um, – I like what GP did. They You can't really see it. Again, I can't quite get it to, to focus right. But the date window, it's got the magnifier internally. It's not on top yeah. the. On Does top it the work? Box. Yeah, it works really well because this is um, this is a uh, a modular chronograph. You can see the uh, uh, you can see the you know uh, the crown is below the pushers, oh, yeah. so that means that the date wheel is further down in the case, and so they put it down like at dial level, and you can really see the date pretty well. Um, but, what size um, is that? It looks. It looks it's a little smaller. It's like a, yeah. it's probably like a 38, 37. So it's a little bit, it's almost like a dress chronograph is really how I kind of treat it, especially with the gold accents. The pushers are gold. The crown is gold. Um, and uh, I forgot what year this is now. GP 4900. But uh, it's a neat thing they did. It's probably based on a, it's an at a movement that they put a, uh, you know, chronograph uh, a piece on top of. But uh, the dial is, is like an engine turn dial in the middle. Uh, and it's the only watch with roman numerals that i really like they work on this watch so mark and i are like not roman numeral guys but um but it works so and it's a pulsation so that's pretty cool too awesome i right, trust uh pete what are you wearing i am wearing well i have laying on the desk a yeah. chopin luc Ooh. time traveler one. Oh, oh beautiful oh, beautiful yeah. so um picked that up yesterday Wow. wow. Congratulations. Is yeah. A new what? A new model. Yeah. No, that's been out since 20, I'm going to say 2016, 2014. I've never seen that before. Yeah. That's really cool. nice. So I've been wanting to add a, um, I've been wanting to add a, a world timer to my collection for probably two years. And mm -hmm. I very quickly identified this is the one I wanted. And then yeah. I was just having I was having breakfast with a mate about six months ago, saying, um, you know, thinking of getting a world timer, blah blah blah. While that's still hanging in the air, he said, "Oh, look, let me show you this new, this watch I just bought," and it was this exact watch. And this friend is notorious for the fact that watches come and watches go pretty quickly. So I just we came to a very quick over a coffee and bacon and egg sandwich agreement <laughs> on first dibs and price. And then, sure enough, here we are. We he, he has to be a responsible adult. Was looking to move the watch on, so I said, "Yeah, I'll take it off you now." Wow. Brilliant. Awesome. And then was a bad friend by showing him a watch that I was pretty confident he would love, and he did. And now he's trying to figure out how to buy that whilst at the same time being a responsible adult. And in the back of my mind, <laughs> I know he's going to be moving it on. So I'm now thinking I've got to save to be able to pick that up in December-ish. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. Uh, awesome. Uh, Dave, what are you wearing? I am wearing the Maurice Lacroix Pontos oh. S uh, Red Bar Edition, which was oh. the very first Red Bar watch that was done. Hmm. And it was the early days, so we only did 10 of them. So this is number oh, nine of ten. Wow! Yeah, wow. So it was pretty cool, pretty limited, um, and this was a model they quickly discontinued. And they've only just brought the Pontos back. I think it was last year. But yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a screw down internal bezel uh, 
as well. So it's screwed down. You can unlock it. It's 300 meter waterproof. Screw down crown. It's a helium release valve built in the side there as well. So yeah, it's a cool little number. This is a, actually such a cool watch for the money that they were charging for it in the day. It's a full rubber strap as well. So you can go play in the water with it if you want. Decent little clasp. So yeah, this is a cool little mm. piece. Don't wear it that often, but actually I do enjoy wearing it when I have it on. Nice. Now it looks cool. Very cool. The, yeah. The Pontos is a really nice collection. They should that's a that's one they should just lock away and say that's this is something we do. Yeah, I think they I think it was I'm sure it was last year. Two years ago, I think we first saw some prototypes. They were talking about bringing it back. They've made it a little bit thinner. They've made it slightly smaller in diameter because this is, I wouldn't say it's huge, but it's not tiny mm. either. They've just slimmed it all down, but they've dropped a few features. I think it's come back to like 200 meter rather than 300. doesn't have the helium re release valve, yada, yada, yada. It's nice in terms of it's more probably mainstream, but not quite mm. as cool a watch for the sake of what it is. Yeah, awesome. Thomas, what you you're up next? What are you wearing? I'm still going through the honeymoon phase of my um Scottish Watches Isotope collaboration. Oh the, yeah, uh, Hydrium mm. Alba. Nice. Which is serving me very well. I'm really enjoying this. It's a great watch. Good, excellent. Cool piece. Yeah. Of... yeah, cool. Mark, you're up next. What are you wearing? I am reverting to type with a Christopher Ward. Limpston C60 Limpston. So mm. this is the forged carbon dial, no date, and uh, a compass bezel, which is nice to see, but practically useless because it's so loose it just wanders around the dial if you open it up. But it's <laughs> it's it's there. It's driving my OCD crazy because I can't get north back to twelve o'clock. <laughs> but other oh. than that. Other than my mental health issues it's causing, it's a lovely watch. You know, made all, you know, works perfectly with the brushed, with the brushed uh, bracelet. Yeah. That's nice. what I'm wearing today. Awesome. Cool. And then I'll round this out with maybe probably a brand we might be talking about today, but I'm still wearing the Bremont. Um, and I've got it on a um, Watches of Espionage, the Instagram uh, handle. He makes, he's started doing straps now. So this is a full Velcro strap. With his little ID on there, yeah, great Instagram. Uh, Instagram, if you've not seen it before, watches of espionage. He's like ex CIA or something, and he writes stories about military watches. Really cool. So I think I've talked about it before. So if you want to find out which uh, which awful dictator has the same watch as you, he's got you covered. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, well, we're definitely going to go through uh, watches and wonders now. I think I think I'll throw this to the panel because I have been writing down what I think are the most popular predictions of what everybody's saying. But does any or we can just go around and see if we've got any predictions of our own. So how should we how should we start? Does anyone have like a strong prediction they want to they want to kick this off with, or shall I go through the list list and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll agree or disagree? I've got one. I think it's all right. You go. You go first, Todd. Well, well mine's silly, so I'll do my silly one first, and then Dave can do a real one because he's in the know. But I'm thinking that Grand Seiko will release a dial that's inspired by nature. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is how it starts, is it? This is how it <laughs> I, I feel strong in this regard. If we're going to start oh, that oh, strong, I've, yeah, I've got yeah. one. You would have more, Todd, you would have more kind of veracity if you were able to name which window pane they were looking out of of the prefecture right. at which <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a Google map and I'll look satellite and I'll pick out one of the ones they haven't used yet. Uh, and you have to know what time of day it was. But <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. the specific yeah. season, nice. specific season and the daylight conditions. <laughs> yes. so, is it a mountain, yeah. a lake? Is it a, <laughs> a fish pond? Is it a... It'll, yeah. it'll, it'll be the it'll puddle. be the reflections of like Mount Fuji uh, during springtime when the winds blow from the south or something like that. Yeah. I'm making that up, but that <laughs> sounds like it could be a good candidate. Yeah, probably you're if probably get, the only one that's going to get this right. <laughs> if we're going to go silly, there's I, I I can go with two silly ones. One of them I already <laughs> mentioned in the pre. There will be a new dial variation from Rolex. Sure. Um, we will get something in a new color. 
And yeah. also, I'll give a bonus tutor prediction. We will get a prediction. We will get a new tutor that was once a model of Rolex. I have a tutor prediction mm. too, but we'll. Oh. <laughs> I'll wait my turn. Mm. 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 Yeah. Okay. Go on, Dave. What, what What was yours? I think it's going to be a relatively quiet show, to be honest. In the grand scheme of things, there's yeah, there's. I think they're very cognizant of the market at the moment, which is how shall we say soft is you know they're not really for saying that it's bad but it is bad and uh, there's a lot of inventory out there so i would suggest there's not a huge amount there'll be a lot of dial colors case material derivations or deviations on what they currently have at the moment but there's not going to be a huge amount new i don't think other than bremont who of course are making a big uh, song and dance there spending a large sum of money to attend and have a big stand at the actual show this year and I think they, by all accounts, allegedly have some very new things to show at that. Sh- at that, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, that would be yeah. that would be interesting, wouldn't it? See what Braymont came out with. Thomas, did you have one? I think Dave's right. It's going to be a very, very quiet show. We've already had a couple of teasers. One from Rescent with their Type Eight Cobalt Blue. One from Chapek with a short they've done with a new Antarctic. Um, Mount Erebus, which is coming out on the 26th of March. Um, Until Jody. (laughs) Apart apart from (laughs) Erebus, yeah. Um, But um, apart from apart from the Rolex, I mean, we've had ID guys say that the um, Tudor going to maybe he wants Tudor to bring out a um, a big block. Let's see the big block reinterpretation. Mm. Um, re reimagine that. Um, I'd love that. I love the big block. It was a great, great uh, watch. But that was using a Valtteri seven seven fifty, and that they're, they're not using those anymore. So you wouldn't get the the sub dials at twelve nine and six. So um, I. <laughs> I don't know. It wouldn't be the same sort of looking watch, I don't think. But um, I mean, I, I want a different different case shaped watches. I, I I want things like Tag to bring out uh, the poor man's cushion case, uh, the poor man Carrera, you know, and things like mm. old vintage reissues, um, the Silverstone again. Um, I want Cartier to bring out things like the. Uh, clock which was the bell-shaped watch the um cheech which was the better wind shaped uh headpiece that was awarded to drivers of the paris Dakar rally which had been out of production for 40 years the Baskerland, the uh stepped octagonal case to crystal or i want um i mean all sorts of the, the Autosport by Zenith, you know, vintage cushion case. Right. Okay. Uh, watch. So I'd like to see lots of different case shapes, but it's not going to happen. It's, I mean, you can end up with Tudor building on the FXD line even more and uh, uh, maybe going into the vintage catalog a bit. And uh, who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, next time, Thomas, if you can put a little bit more thought into these things, why don't I invite you on to the line? <laughs> <laughs> no, those were great. No, I really appreciate it. Yeah, there was, there was some good ones in there, wasn't there? Wasn't there? Um, Mark, did you have anything? You, you, any, um, any thoughts? Nothing serious other than um, I predict the, the Tudor fans will be upset because there's no Tudor sub and... Uh, <laughs> Maybe they yeah. they will maybe Tudor will dive deeper into the Pantone Pantone color book for dial colors, but uh, really I, I I agree with uh, everyone else. I think this is going to be a relatively quiet show. I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, big surprises. Yeah. Well, should we go? Through, well, should we start with Tudor then? Pete's favorite subject. Um, because so, Adrian had some, Adrian had some good predictions. Well, he had some prediction for Tudor, but then I was thinking as I was writing them down, I was like, Adrian has such a good relationship with Tudor, he sort of can't get them right, can he? Because then it would look like he's accidentally announced 
the Tudor watches without, um, you know, without sort of. If I, if I remember, if I remember his video right, it was more less prediction, more this is what I would like to see. Mm-hmm. I think he did, um, which yeah, might so give he... him a little bit with a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, they were pretty good though. Actually, he so he said um, the white. The, the BlackBerry Pro would get a white dial. So well, there's a Polo Explorer too. So that's my first prediction coming. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, and then he said that there'll be that Rolex. Every, everybody thinks that one of the predictions that most people have is that Rolex will do a Coke GMT, but he's saying that actually he thinks that Tudor will do a Coke GMT. Oh. They could. Entirely, and, yeah. and, and, and I mean, and this is this is kind of the silliness of it. We're now having to debate over which brand will get an already well-known, you know, bezel exactly. treatment. That yeah. is exactly, that's sad. We have, become. yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I think, I, 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 think, I think white could, I think white could become a, a relatively common release color because there are a few brands pushing that kind of narrative. You've obviously not like to push out the white Speedmaster. And white does seem to be a color that's kind of coming back into the mainstream. So I would think I'll be surprised if we don't see more white or those kind of opaline silvery white dials making an appearance. I think that's a pretty easy one for a lot of them as well. Yeah, yeah and I think it's, white is the I new think, black. <laughs> that is definitely true. I think that white, black, when it was first introduced, because it's funny, we think of black watches being around forever, but they're actually relatively new towards the 50s and 60s, and black was the colour of modernity. But And for a long time, make something black and you were indicating it was modern. But I feel like now that we're getting heritage re-editions of black watches, white is kind of the new new. It's and not cream or linen or any of that. It's got to be, be yeah. It's got to be proper white, not this kind of yeah. opaline silver like that, that a lot of them claim as white. Yeah. Proper white yeah. dial. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what, for example, that's what um, Omega was going for with their Speedmaster of mm-hmm. really crisp, clean space. You know, people joke about, it, but I really do think they probably had in their mind we want some, we want this to look like a spacesuit. Um, I think that mm. that white is coming back and it's kind of going to be used as the symbol of the new. Mm-hmm. But the, um, having seen the white Speedmaster, that's, um, almost like a porcelain white. It's not a very robust white. It's like a porcelain, mm. porcelain type color. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they haven't just taken a whole bunch of what white emulsion paint and splashed it on the dial. Yeah. It, it, it's not that robust or white. It, it's a lovely, it's a lovely, uh, lovely dial, but it's, uh, a s- more subtle than you might think. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, no great. Yeah, I point. think I think you're right about white dials, Pete. Definitely, because every, everyone's been pining for a white dial Rolex Explorer, haven't they? For instance, I mean, no, certainly, certainly, well, I never. The, 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 the Rolex, the Rolex, the Rolex fanboys, the Rolex fanboys have though. They've been harping on about that for years. They've been <laughs> saying white dial Rolex Explorer. I mean, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I think that was Ooh. one of my. <laughs> I, I just saw Kent Daigle's comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, <laughs> so Adrian's other two. He had some heavy hitters for Tudor, so he thought that the that that Tudor Prince chronograph with that they made for the was it one watch only watch mm-hmm. that was in mm-hmm. gold. He thinks that that will be a, a model. They'll make a variant of that as in the current range. Well, they've, that that's a thing they've done, um, yep. which is you know follow the, the the the, the um, what is it that only watch introduce something at only watch and then a year or two later come back with that. I th- I think that watch is definitely coming. I think it yeah. will absolutely arrive. Um, it is an all new movement, and would they have? It it, it feels very quick to have an all new chronograph movement up and running and bedded in sufficiently that you could run, that you could be able to provide production 
numbers um, that well, quickly. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can't. I, I don't bear, know. Bear, bear in mind, probably since the very early days of Kinesi, you know, the the easy one was the time only. And they've had that for a good few years now. They will absolutely have been working on chronograph technology. There was a deal they have, obviously, with uh, Breitling in terms of access, vice versa. So they'll been working on it. And let's not forget, around about a year ago, just over a year ago, they opened a big fancy new factory in Switzerland, which is all uh, robotized. So it's entirely possible that that might be the subtle well it won't be subtle if they release it at the show because it will come out with a big bang but they could you know one thing rolex group are good at is keeping things under their hat so if anyone can keep a secret like that and drop it on you without any warning it will be them yeah i've been i must admit i've been predicting that we will get the big block this year but i suppose yeah. i'm they did only open the factory this year um and do they feel comfortable that they've bedded down their production of this so well that they're going to go out? I, I think it's – yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's a 50-50. We might see it. We might not. But, yeah, definitely we are going to see it, if not this year, next year, because mm. my gut feel is the Tudor Breitling thing is done. That that race has run its course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a big block or something like the Tiger Woods, the Tiger needs to be reissued definitely, and it's it's on the it's on the horizon. Yeah, and and it would be very exciting to see a new chronograph. Yeah, yeah, that would just just yeah. just in and of itself, just somebody having a a good look, a good think about how to make a chronograph. Can they make it slimmer? Can they make it? more water resistant or you can make it water resistant if you put a big enough case on it but uh a new take on chronograph design would be exciting just on its own don't care who don't yeah. care who makes it yeah the yeah. other the other one possibly that they could drop a white dial into potentially is they've obviously got the um the black ceramic black bay which has been out for a couple of years now. Oh, that's yeah. a watch that would cry out for a white dial if ever there was one. Uh, whether they do or don't, that's a whole. That's just me just um, throwing it out there. But that's a oh, watch yeah. that could suddenly drop a white dial and it would be pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, Adrian also, one of his predictions was that there'll be a new 42 millimeter Pelagos because it was the, it's an anniversary year for it. Or, or the anniversary passed. Possibly. Yeah. yeah, the, the I think the danger would be that it's sort of like with the Pelagos thirty nine that starts to black bay it a little bit, so it it becomes gets a bit more of the family look. So again, it's it's the um that's the one shooter I could one day maybe see myself buying, but I so therefore I hope they never change it. But I suspect <laughs> yeah. they'll do like the thirty nine, and it will get black bayified yeah that's yeah. a good point yeah I, i'd like a new blue dial pelagos with the date maybe <laughs> uh we, we, we've we've not hit one that everybody's like super excited to see yet um the pelagos is great i love the pelagos i'm with you i mean I, i'm with you and pete i love the pelagos it's a, it's the it is the modern to the sub i mean that everyone's crying out for it is the to the sub it's 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 uh i, I love it are... and, uh... sorry, I, Mark, think there, sorry. I think there are two things wrong with the pelagos right now um that ugly hour hand has got to go <laughs> oh really oh, that yeah. hour hand has got to like go it. i quite like and it. um like doesn't it have about forty thousand words written on the dial yeah, all that dial text again. Got to go. <laughs> yeah, th there is a lot of text. Okay, well let's let's switch gears. And so we did Tudor. <clears throat> I was reading a Chrono Next article, and they were saying that before we go to Rolex, because we're gonna have to talk about Rolex, obviously. But they were saying that their strong prediction was that IWC will reissue the Aquatimer, or they'll renew it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the musical interlude today. We might get too close to the. Yeah. <laughs> that's the <laughs> thing that we should be talking about. Yeah. <laughs> On one hand, that's a really safe bet because I think 
I think there's been a production. There's been a prediction that the aqua timer is going to be overhauled every year for the. In fact, I'll go further. There has been a rumor that the aqua timer was going to get overhauled every year since I joined the hobby. Um, it's <laughs> it's um, a watch which hasn't received a lot of love um, and needs an update at some point. So you just keep on saying it. You, it's like pick the weakest link of every watch brand and just say, well, that has to get updated. Somehow IWC has avoided that, but they, they'll have to sooner or later. Or they can do a Zenith. I actually think IWC would be better off doing a Zenith and not having a dive watch. That's one thing I'd love to see from Zenith. It's, they need to have a dive watch. <laughs> they need a dive watch in their range. No, they, they don't. They're, they're... No, they don't. I actually think... <laughs> Do you think they're best off being a chronograph brand, a chronograph only brand? Because they not, have had the dive watch in the past and it was great. It was lovely. There are alternatives to a dive watch. You know, like there's sure, a, sure. It's, 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 Fi or they've done pilots' watches. They've got all these other things. Why why do it? I agree. It's it, it's it's the one category that when you don't have it, everyone screams that you should have it. And the minute that some brands do try and do it, they then get slammed for not doing it properly. So I think they're best off just leaving it be. You know, Zenith are not as big a brand as most people will give them yeah. the credit of being. They think they're much bigger. They really aren't. They're pretty small in total volume. And, you know, they've got plenty of options within the wider group if they want to play with dive watches. So they're better off just, in my opinion, sticking with what they're pretty good at, which is a lot of chronographs and some really tidy time only pieces and pilots watches they're good at it they may as well stick at it yeah the the thing about a group is all they care about is the group they don't really necessarily care that every watch brand is doing really well they just they don't get paid by the brand they just get paid by the group um mm -hmm. And I think there's a strength to that. We all complain about it, but I think there's also a real strength to that. You can just kind of let a brand be good at what it's good at rather than make it have to do everything. And so I'd love to let them, I'd love to see IWC and IWC say, you know what, we're not a dive, dive watch brand. This is not what we do. Mm -hmm. um, let it go. Yeah. And also, it makes sense, to be honest, from a certain extent, if you say, okay, so Zenith play in that area, Tagwire play in this area, Hublot play in this area, it's just much more sensible from a business kind of layout perspective as well. If you look at Swatch Group, how many brands have they got that literally completely overlap each other other than at price point? You know, if you look at Longines and you look at uh, Omega, mm -hmm. They do the same categories right across. They're far too. We've talked about this before in previous kind of uh, uh, outings of this. How many watches do they have in their catalog, and how lost do you get trying to work out what they do? At least with Zenith, you know what they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And speaking, and I, I know we weren't speaking a tag in particular, but I went into an outlet mall. I went into it with the family today to an outlet mall in Florida, the Vineland Outlet Mall, it's called, and they have a tag outlet there. And really? they had a case full of um, that or the Hoya Ortavia reissue they mm -hmm. did from a few years ago. My right, favorite yeah. ever one yeah. they did with just Hoya on the dial, and I thought that was a huge seller for them. And it was it was the one with the beads of so their version of the beads and rice was yeah. six thousand reduced to three thousand eight hundred dollars. And I th wow. always thought that that was wow. like a raging success. That that was the one that kind of, for me, mentally turned it. And Pete, I think we've even talked about it on there, but it must, if it's in outlets now, and they had like all the different versions, a very bizarre I thought. That's that's something a few brands do. They do it very quietly. I think there's a Brightwing outlet store somewhere um, <laughs> where rather than have everything escape to Joma Shop and get on the internet and become kind of famous for being massively discounted, they actually either buy back or withhold the stock. It never actually even got sent out in the first place. And then they just quietly leak it out at um, at outlet stores and, and things like that. And yeah. I think the fact that we loved the Ortavia and we all thought it was great, but it didn't sell, 
tells you a lot about how out of touch watch geeks are. Well, I, I tell you, what, I was about to about to say that is that it, it's interesting to see outside the bubble. And Sam, I think, just yeah. provided us with a great example of the bubble, and yeah, hmm. and the, the bubble irony. versus reality. Yeah, the irony yeah. with this is is that they've the tag outlet so if anybody visits orlando it's vineland outlet mall the tag outlet just moved to a bigger showroom so they could they could get more retail space and the store that shut down that they took over was the invicta store <laughs> so, you know, they took over the invicta space and invicta's gone now so the invicta with the crazy uh where it used to have the crazy um you know buy six buy one watch and get six free or whatever it was yeah um so, so so it it was it was quite an eye opener. I'm like this. I went and I said this used to be in Victor. She's like, yeah. And I said, are these on discount? Yeah, yeah, they are. And they had uh, they had quite a few models there. Yeah, and Victor's a kiosk uh, now in the mall. That's why. Yeah, is that in the middle? Is that a was that a company owned boutique? That, as in, it's it's a tag outlet yeah. or tag branded? It's tag branded. It's not uh, yeah. like a. K is over here or I mean it yeah. might be owned by Mayors or somebody, but it's it's all that is tag branded and all they sell is tags yeah. in there. I would, it, I, it, would it, I would think it's very likely to be the brand because if they're selling that heavily discounted, then there's I mean there's mm. plenty of margin, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Watch, there's plenty of margin in them. But at that kind of level, that that's the kind of level of margin that the brand themselves yeah. would be like, no, that, we're that's not going what to I was share thinking. that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, They're still making money. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's um, and that I wish I had three thousand eight hundred. I would have snapped the hand off like for that because I think that's a you know yeah. f- f- tag chronographic caliber O two or whatever it was with and the mm-hmm. date, beautiful, beautiful. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. To be honest, that was actually one of the few tags in the last few years that I've thought that's I actually quite liked that. I think the very early editions of it did sell well because they were pretty limited production, limited volume when they did the whole kind of fan favorite thing. And then I thought, I think what happened was they decided, oh, this this must be popular and started to churn out a few variations of it. And of course, it didn't have the kind of mainstream popularity. Because remember as well, as much as watch enthusiasts go, oh, you should get rid of Tag and just have Hoyer on it. The vast majority of the general public know it as Tag, tag. Hoyer. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, mm-hmm. like, they'll just, they'll question, where have you, where's Tag? Why have you taken Tag off it? You know, and what's the brand common, what's the brand commonly called? It's called a Tag, isn't it? It's not called a Hoyer. Mm-hmm. The average guy in the street says, oh yeah, I got a, I got a Tag from a 21st or my 25th. They don't say, yeah. oh yes, uh, how dare they put Tag in it? It should be Hoyer. Don't, don't they know the history of this brand? <laughs> Yeah, 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 many people can't even say Hoya, can they? They're like tag her, 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 tag her, her. her. Yeah, yeah, tag, yeah. Tag, yeah. Tag her is the best one that I hear quite often. And I just think, yeah. oh, poor, poor Mister Hoya. But but, but it and sounds it just, better with your yeah. accent, Dave, than anybody else's <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> tag her. <laughs> but it's, it's funny, like yeah. they say, people never change their minds on online. But I've definitely changed my mind about tag over since I've been doing this. I should say. Well, tag up been yeah, a gateway, a gateway, a gateway brand for so many people, weren't they? About like 20, 30 years ago. I mean, the two hundred series, the one thousand series, two thousand series, the one thousand series, the Formula Ones. Yeah, like Mark mm-hmm. says, the gateway brand for so many people in, into the hobby. Yeah, it's like that like cherry flavor twenty twenty that gets you into drinking as a kid. <laughs> Yeah, and they've really pushed their game up and from a you know, they've pushed their game up as well. They are lifting the quality, they're lifting the kind of price point and you know the, the visibility with things like uh, the Barbie movie and all these kind of things as well has really kind of given it a bit of a, a kick up the backside as well. It's interesting, they've really changed their strategy here in Australia. I'd be curious to know if it's mm-hmm. happening around the world. Here they were they became super famous because they were the best watch brand sold at jewelry stores in every mall so if you were going through a mall and you saw two or three jewelry stores their their range would all top out at a, at a tag and so you got the impression you know if you weren't paying attention that this is a great watch brand this is like as good as it gets type thing curiously though i think that had another problem of jewelers can't sell watches they don't know anything about the watch um and so that's, I think, where a lot of the mall watch kind of vibe comes from. It's for, it's from, 
for people that don't know anything about watches from people that don't know anything about watches. Mm. But anyway, in Australia, Tag is pulling out of all of those jewellery stores. Um, they, mm. they aren't. They're not in malls. They're not in. If you're not a dedicated watch seller, you don't get a tag. And I think right. that's making a difference to how they're seen here. And I'd be curious yeah. to see if that's yeah. happening overseas. That's been the strategy in Europe and the UK for quite a few years now. They've effectively they pulled out of all the what should we call them low to middle rent watch stroke jewellery type mm. places. They went into better quality watch retailers typically as maybe their entry or just above entry offering you know if you take out the kind of seiko type offerings they sit just above that and then in the last few years they've really been pushing boutique narrative like in yeah. pretty yeah. much every city in the uk and in europe now every high street will have a tag boutique and it just yeah. tag alone you know yeah. if, I look at, if, I look, if i look at glasgow um it was in the not so good jewelry stroke watch stores 10 years ago they all disappeared at least five years ago and you could only buy it in brand stores such as lanes and places like that then suddenly there was a shop and shop and then suddenly i had a complete standalone boutique and as it stands today they've got a big store in glasgow double store unit all tag fancy looking place and it's still, um, I think it's run as a, a branded boutique by one of the AAD partners, but it is a standalone store. And I think Tag are pushing the same boutique strategy quite hard in the US as well. So there were yeah. three uh, boutiques opened in my local upscale mall. And what, you know, it was an IWC, it was a Tag and a Panerai. And, and they're all in a row, they're, they're next to each other. Um, so I would say they are definitely yeah. pushing that boutique strategy. Which means yeah. if they're all in a row as well, that's a good sign that it's been run by a retail partner. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of uh, of Panerai, a few years ago at Watches and Wonders, everyone was doing watches made from recycled materials, weren't they? Like Panerai did that silly thing, that e steel. Do you think that's going to be a theme this year? More renewables or oh, Panerai? Panerai last year were ridiculous. They went for really high end. They did things like. Minute repeaters, tourbillons, um, all sorts of things that were on show. Bizarre. They were going for the really high-end price point, but I couldn't imagine anybody who'd be buying them. But um, it, was, it was quite bizarre what they were showing last year at Watches and Wonders. But, um, I, I don't, well, don't know what on earth they're going what what tack they're going to go for this year. It's, it's going to be really interesting. I mean... I think they went too. They went too. They went too strong last year. They went all out. Yeah, I think they kind of an album. Bizarrely, I think if you've been pushing like any kind of sustainability message, you have to keep pushing it, mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, then you make all of the criticisms of you pushing sustainability real. I mean, the big the big push is. They're not really into it. This is all just something they do for marketing. It's all just greenwashing. And the minute you stop, that becomes true. But if you yep. keep doing it, it becomes real. So you have to keep doing it. That's true. And I think also there's a few brands that have, that have popped through like ID Genève and places like that who are actually pushing a truer narrative with regards to you know, kind of sustainable materials. There was definitely a, there's been a kind of um, tact taken with a few folk where there was all the plastics, you know, pull plastic bottles out of the ocean, recycle them and make watch cases or straps or whatever out of them. And that seems to have softened a little bit now because folks start to ask obvious questions like, so how much energy did you, how much energy did you use to actually recycle this? And then they start doing the real equations and saying, so no, actually, sometimes shock horror it's actually better to burn it or put it in the ground than it is to you know to recycle it so i think that narrative has softened you know a lot of the brands were just shouty shouty about it they were taking the low-hanging fruit and then i wouldn't say they've, got, they've, they've not been caught out but they've maybe been called out a little bit so i think that whole narrative has definitely been settled a little bit shall we say yeah mm -hmm. i it was it was funny reading because i was geeking out and to watch i'm into you know, I was reading the the Breitling sustainability uh, report, 
and they was they did a like a, a full view, review of their carbon footprint, and they were finding that the biggest the biggest places where they spend the most like carbon is in transport, um, mm -hmm. boutique fit out um, was huge. So what you chose to fit your boutiques out in had a massive effect, mm -hmm. um, and packaging. And so that's where they've put most of their actual, you know, they still, they talk about having a, there is an element of you have to advertise these things. So they have that relationship with outer known and stuff like that. But really their efforts are in, there were, you know, things like picking better furniture for the, for the boutiques, minimizing the amount of travel, maximizing things like those virtual summits yep. they do, that sort of stuff. Mm. Yeah, get get getting a boutique furniture made in the local market is another big one that a lot of them mm. are pushing because previously it was all being made in Asia or wherever it was being made and then shipped all over the world to fit out shops. Now they kind of come up with this uh, design criteria and they just get it made in the local market. That you know, which it, boring but sensible things that they're making, but that's not exactly marketable. Like as now, ooh, look at our new fancy schmancy case material that we can sing and dance about because. The reality is, you know, it doesn't make much difference in the grand scheme of things. So it's yeah. still a very much a scope one, scope two, sustainability stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Ha having said that, I'll put my I'll, I'll put my safety hat on <laughs> and say that, you know, one of the things that we talk about is it kind of doesn't matter how small a change you make. You know, if it's reasonably practicable that you should do something, you should do it. Um, so if you're Swatch and you can come up with bioceramic that uses 15% less carbon, you should do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's this, this idea of we, we sometimes fall into the trap of if it's not going to save the world, it's not worth doing. But yeah. maybe if it does, only it's worth taking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's applying the Rolex strategy to your sustainment model. Yeah. Well, speaking of Rolex, should we should we go through a few of those predictions <laughs> and see if yeah see if we agree I'll with tell you what my first prediction is whatever any oh. of us say is as likely to be wrong as it is to be right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, you're generous on Rolex <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> Rodriguez prediction. Um, well, first of all, a lot of people are saying the 1908 is it, they they. They released it last year. This year is the year of complications, like perpetual calendars, moon phases. Yeah, know. yeah, I definitely agree. I think I think um, it's definitely the new uh, moon phase. The Cellini moon phase is a beautiful watch. Um, I think uh, the nineteen oh eight is definitely their area to do those sort of things. Maybe an annual calendar. Maybe. Uh, Moon fades, like you say, I think uh, the 19 has a great potential for that sort of thing. Yeah, but and maybe... Did, they, did the Cellini moon phase sell? It can be a beautiful watch, but I if it doesn't sell... I don't know whether it sold a lot, Yeah, I don't know I whether think, it sold a lot, sorry. Yeah, I don't think it did, but then on the other hand, the whole Cellini line got a stink on it and no one wanted to touch it in the end. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of didn't matter as dress watches became more popular. And as people started thinking more about getting something other than sport sports watches, I think Rolex saw the writing on the wall and said, Cellini has got a stink on it. We need to start something new. And when so you mean I think the 1908 mean, is that. What do you mean by stink? You mean that they would always make people, the, the, the impression was that you had to buy one of those in order yep. to get a sports medal. That's what you mean about the bad vibe. I think yeah. there, was, there was a bit of that and there was a bit of, um, you know, within the Rolex community, do you have a, Ro do you have a real Rolex or do you have a Cellini? Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, sort of thing. Mm. And, and unfair, nice watch, nothing wrong with it, but it was just, you know, weird branding dynamics. I think that, that they had to change it. My my only issue, I think, I think the 1908 was created to be the base for for complications. I think that will naturally come. My only reservation is it's only been out for a year, um, yeah. and give it time. Yeah, I think they might want to. It's just it would that would be like so fast for Rolex to yeah. release a watch one yeah. year. 
release Maybe complications. Maybe in 10 years. Like, we'll have the same conversation in 10 years. And at that point, well, they'll release something. They've, they've got to assess whether it's actually worth the investment to put the complications in. And one year on, there's not a lot of sales data on the 1908 range. That's right. I, I, I'll i predict that not this year, absolutely positively not this year, mm. but in within two or three years, we'll start seeing complications in the Daytona. Mm. You know, mm, I don't know. We'll see something like the Jean-Paul Keeley, Jean-Claude Keeley thing come back. Not sure on that one. I, I don't nah. think I, I, I don't think they'll push a particularly heavy game with when it comes to complications. Sure, they might they might play with a moon phase. They might play with the they might play with a world timer. They might play with like a something like that, a GMT, you know, whether they do GMT anyway, but you know, a world timer. I don't think it's highly unlikely, I think, that they'll push down this kind of high complication route because it's just not their market. It just isn't their market you know they're starting to go head to head with patek and yeah. if you think you know patek and rolex pretty much play in the same customer base by and large yeah patek go for the dressier complication game classic rolex play the more kind of modern sporty game and they're very complementary in many senses that way there's very little true overlap i don't think they would upset the apple cart too hard on that one I, I don't think they're going to go super high in complication. They're going to try and compete with Patek. I'd be clear about that. I think we'll just see it'll top out at things like annual calendars. I agree with you. Things like an annual calendar, which they already do. Yep. Um, things like uh, world time, which curiously they don't do, but it would. It's not a super it's a high thing. In, it's a big. It's a big thing in Patek world timers, though. It is. That would be an interesting statement for mm -hmm. Rolex to come out with a world timer. But, um, yeah, I just think that – and, and where, where this is coming from is the changes they made to the Daytona Le Mans last year, things like making it a little bit more dressy, taking it back in time just a little bit, um, polishing up the movement and giving us a display case back, just made me feel like – a little bit like the 1908. They've created a platform for that watch – to be a little bit more than it's been. Or conversely, mm -hmm. take it back to what it was um, about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, next I think one. the other thing... Oh, sorry, go I was going to say, I, I, th I think the only other thing you might see with them is my gut is they're going to bring out, a bit like last year, a couple of just complete oddball left-field weirdo yeah. things, you know, yeah. because they don't need to make any. They make a tiny number of them. And they keep it super exclusive, but it will get all the call of inches all over the world. Yeah. Because they're, you know, they, let's be honest, they, they make a million plus watches a year. They are the big boy in volume terms of the luxury watch market. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And the market is much softer than it was. And they're beginning to be able to supply the wider market who have got that demand that's still there. There's still plenty of people who've been waiting God knows how many months, stroke years for their Daytona or their Pepsi or their Submariner or whatever. I think this year will be, there won't be too much. If there is anything, it will be big news pieces where they make X hundred of them a year and that's it. Okay. So you don't reckon a lot of people are predicting the a 41, a, a reduced size sea dweller, like a 41 mil or something along those lines? No, stupid idea, I think. I it's think such, the, the, Submar the Submariner's yeah. already 41 mil, and uh, yeah. the Sea Dweller is a 43 big and the sea, two one. Yeah, and, and, and the Sea Dweller is not, by any stretch, one of their better sellers. You know, it's it, it's really not. I mean, I know somebody that picked one up last week, in fact, I think it was, who asked about it two months ago. Yeah, hmm. I, I, if somebody... somebody uh, became fast friends with on the on the cruise he'd bought a beautiful sea dweller and he'd actually walked into a boutique in paris and, and said this is this is what i'm looking for and they're yep. like oh i'm in an hour and then he came back and they were like actually we've got one because the thing is uh paul his name was he he's got he's got the wrists that can pull off a, a sea dweller it's quite a hard watch to wear isn't it i know people yeah. who bought it and then they've just not been able to wear it because of its size 
Um, yeah. Right. So I, I don't I, I don't see them doing too much with that. So yeah, the ultimate answer is who knows because they'll do whatever they're going to do, and you know the first you'll know about it is the first day of the show. That's a fact. Um, but I don't think there'll be anything huge from them this year. Yeah. Um, so we've we've concentrated a lot on there's other the, the predictions as well, isn't there? Like um, the, the, we talked about the White Dal Explorer, maybe the Yachtmaster going all gold. The Yachtmaster, not Master t- uh, Two, is it the one going all gold? And then the um, the Coke GMT, and perhaps the they'll perhaps the grey and the black and grey will get it make its way to a steel GMT. Yeah. That was a Watch Eric prediction. So it's been it's been quite all over, but yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's got it. I mean, nobody predicted the Titanic. Well, actually, did some, I know people thought the Titanic might go in the Submariner, didn't they? Last yes, year? yes, yeah. yeah, and that that definitely. Yeah, did. I mean, the the Titanium for say the Sea Dweller makes a lot of sense. It's a big heavy watch. Replace it with a with a lighter material. That makes sense. It's not a big seller, so you can kind of ease your way into the production cycle. Um, could happen i don't think it's likely i'm not predicting it but yeah well should we talk about because uh swatch obviously tried to steal the show again didn't they with the with the moon swatch releasing the snoopy we've not talked about it yet i mean it's definitely had a lot of column inches but we've not talked about it yet but what what do we think on the old new snoopy it's a a win no matter what you think of this whether you want to buy one don't want to buy one whether you think they're you know, milking the same cow for God knows how long. I guarantee you, come 26, come Tuesday, there will be queues at every single yeah, Swatch yeah. store that's selling this. That The vast majority of folk queuing won't get one. Folk will be upset. They'll be selling for two, three, four, five times their retail price for a week or two. Yeah. That is a commercial success, however you look at it. No matter what you think, whether it's good or bad, from a, I think it looks great. I think it looks really cool. I, I do. It's exactly what they should be doing with with these watches as well. And fair play to them. I want one. Yeah, I I want one. yeah. it's the first uh, moon swatch I've been interested in. It's uh, and the moon phase complication just brilliant. Love it. Is that what it is? A moon phase? I've not. It is a moon phase. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty nine and a half day markers around it, and the wee Snoopy on it. It is funny. I've I found myself thinking. You're milking it. You're um sort of milking the what's the expression? Um, cash cow. Yeah, cash cow. So brands that brands that you don't like milk the cash cow. Browns brands that you do like respect their um, watches and keep them alive and keep them going forever. It's like if everything we just said about why we don't like this it's clearly going to be popular in the market blah 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 Mm -hmm. is exactly why we say rolex is the greatest company in the world because they give the public what they want and blah 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 blah. i I just i think this watch is great i think this i think this this watch is great it's just Mm -hmm. that i'm i'm old enough to be patient yeah well that's Mm -hmm. it if i want one i can wait i can wait six months nobody needs to I will absolutely give them that. You know, they have made it very clear. It's been added to the core range. It's not limited edition. And actually, that to me is like a double marketing win. They are proactively saying, you know, without actually saying, don't be an idiot and buy one on the resale market. They're saying this, they're saying it without saying it, but still it will end up on the resale market and they'll sell out for a good few weeks. You know, you can't you can't knock them from that side of things. And you, but as you say, wait a month, you'll be able to pick one up. Wait two, maybe two months, right. you'll get one. But right. you know, you'll get one quick enough. Yeah, the nice thing about uh, this one too is it will not stain your wrist blue. No, your <laughs> wrist. What, no, your what, wrist what will actually happen though is your wrist will stain it. That's what's going to happen here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is very true. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. It's it's just... car. yeah. Or it'll go yellow because of the sunlight. And it's or... um, <laughs> it, it it's another example of. Uh, Omega putting one over Watches and Wonders. Oh, because this yeah, will just, be talked about. Yeah. Well, well, it's not, will... it's not, it, won't, it won't just be talked about, Mark. It will be seen. I guarantee yeah. you. And because it's bright white and folk yep. will have had it, they will, they will have their sleeves rolled up, they'll have their T-shirts on, and they'll be walking about that show going, 
I got a Snoopy, I got a Snoopy Moon Swatch. And that will be the talk of the show. And I guarantee you in the first day on Hadinki and X, Y, and Z, there will be pictures of people walking around that show wearing their Snoopy Moon Swatch. And, and if I was going to that show and if I owned one, I would do exactly the same. Exactly. <laughs> no <laughs> exactly. doubt about it. <laughs> So you know, you, you, you from from that perspective, it's a you know literally it's a win. knocked it right it's out of the park. Absolute again. win. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And in a way, Watches and Wonders invites brands to release watches that aren't going to Watches and Wonders. It it, it almost it gives you a half. A, you know, use a cricket analogy: a slow half tracker outside off stump. You have to swing at it because all the brands that are going to Watches and Wonders aren't allowed to release anything. So it creates a vacuum that a brand yep. like Breitling or or um, Omega can't let go. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's just such an open target. You have to. It's and when you're a, like, and, and when and when you have got the kind of marketing parts of a brand such as you know a Swatch Group, then you can play that game and win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, before we, we finish up here, is is anybody looking forward to a brand's announcements? Is there any one brand that you're looking forward I, to? Hmm. I'm I, gonna I'm gonna be interested to see Chopard. I know they're gonna just roll out a load more Alpine Eagles, but um I really like the um Lucent XPS salmon dial that they brought out last year. And I'd love to see them bring out some more variations of like as good as that. And also mm -hmm. the L if they can bring out some nice LUC dress watches. Um, I'd really like to see those. But uh, the windows, were just, the cabinets were just full of gold alpine eagles and diamond encrusted alpine eagles last year, uh, which weren't that nice. But um, the Lucency Steel uh, LUC XPS was uh, gorgeous. Cool. Yeah. I'll write that down so we can do a follow up. I'm actually, I, the thing I'm looking forward to most is the thing that I will never buy, I have no interest in buying. And it's the thing that I enjoy most about that show. And it's seeing the high jewelry pieces from the likes of Van Cleef Apparel and these guys, because oh. it's just, it, it's a joy to go and look at things that are absolutely stunningly beautiful from right. how they're made to what they look like. They are horrifically crass in many respects as well, but yeah. it's about the only opportunity that you'll ever get to sit around the table and folk could just hand you half million quids worth of stones bolted onto a watch and you get to play with it and click buttons you know you couldn't even do it in any of their stores and they're the things that i kind of that's a bit that i really enjoy about the show because that's the stuff that's super high artisan I can't and, doesn't get, and doesn't get the coverage I can't, yeah, it's like, to, no just like at gphg the high art the jewelry pieces are the most interesting for me anyway now at gphg yeah because you, you just want to see what, what can be done when you really put your mind to it. Yeah. We might think it's crass, but and to be fair, a lot of it is, but some of it can be stunningly beautiful too. But I can't agree with you more, Dave. The, that, that was my favourite stand last year, the Langley from Arpel stand. Just uh, watches on chains around necklaces and uh, watches yeah. on wrist bangles and all sorts of amazing jewellery, just fascinating. Yeah. I've and never I'm seen I would never see it I, elsewhere. Exactly. And I'm quite looking forward to see what a GLC pulls out because they always do tend to pull out a little kind of something weird and wonderful just at the super weird and exoteric end of things as well. But it's mm. always worth a look. And yeah. finally, well, can know. can Piaget I'm... make a watch even thinner? Yeah. <laughs> I, I really want to know. Can they can they can they shave enough microns off to make it measure? Well, I I really want to see I, that. I, that, one, that one, Mark. Man they'll have you can't even on, see it so on that one mark i got a tip and all <laughs> i'm going to say is one of the brands one of the brands that's known for extremely thin watches and movements that is one of the few that bat between them you know what is there? there's piaget bulgari and a couple of the others that bat between them for the thinnest vying by all accounts one of them is about to pull something out the bag at watches and wonders Oh, I'm I'm mm. actually now excited about Watches and Wonders because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. want to see how thin they can go. I I love that sort of engineering. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's lud it's ludicrously stupid, but it's good. It's ludicrously stupid. It. You're absolutely right, but it's so ludicrously stupid. Yeah, you have to vote for it. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, go on, Pete. What, what's your look, what are you looking forward to? I, I'm, I'm suppose I'm looking hmm. for little things. I'm not expecting any massive changes, and I suppose I'm interested in like Alpina's had a massive change of strategy over the last three or four years, and I'm really curious to see if they follow that up and what that looks like. I want to see if um, Frederick Constant move that monolith block anywhere and if that happens and does anything um that's exactly what i was thinking the right yeah, can I you just, put some complications I, or moon phase on that fca 10 move yeah that or, 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 or yeah, well, they like, put it in a good looking watch please put it in a good well, looking yeah. watch <laughs> here's, here, here's my prediction and whether whether it'll happen here or not i don't know but that monolithic movement in the oh what do they call it high life they're yeah, kind of sporty the thing. Yeah. It's, they've, they've talked about it for two years and they've promised me for two years it's coming. Ah, uh, this could be the year because they've, yeah, I think, solved some of their production issues with the movement. So I think this could be the year. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited to see if that happens. Um, I'd buy it, I'd buy it at the show if they do it. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, but I think. That would be something I'm I'm really interested in. Um, I'm curious to see what Chanel and Hermes do. Okay. Um, mm, Hermes, yeah. And, and, and like Hermes has just been on a roll recently. Um, just produce, but it really does come down to just one or two watches. So I'm curious to see if they'll do something else or just milk the the H zero eight. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Just good. It's not big groundbreaking stuff and i don't particularly care what the really big brands do i'm curious about what the smaller brands do mm. yeah yeah interesting. uh todd what seiko todd what you what are you looking forward to um well yeah what people were talking about i was studying the frederick constant you know possibilities i'd love to see that movement really expand and do more of their line uh because they really haven't done a lot with it i realize there's probably our production issues but to see that 288,800 all right uh beats per hour equivalent would just be outstanding one thing though independent of all that is again i always have to show another watch so this is a 1970 zenith or really this is the movado version with the el primero movement oh yeah it's the triple date moon phase we can't there we go triple date moon phase uh in in what they now call the revival case so i'd like to see zenith come out with the moon phase in the revival case or something like that, similar to what they did, uh, what they've been kind of hitting around a few times like that. So revival, uh, revival, maybe something like that. That's small though. That, that's kind of a small thing. Cool. And then Mark, I think your last one, what, what you, what are you looking forward to? Well, I was, I was looking for, for, for Piaget, but I'm also interested to see, um, what Parmigiani Flachier do. Yeah. Find a new owner. <laughs> well, yeah, it'll be interesting. Do they use this as a kind of a beauty show? This is why you should buy us. Or Bring your checkbook. saving all their pennies. Okay. I've got a prediction. Do you know what my prediction Ooh. is? Uh -oh. Do you know who might, and, and this is, do you know who might be sniffing around them? What, to buy Parmigiani? Um, well, you see, it's not just Parmigiani, is it? Are they, the are they selling match. all the industry bits? It's a, Yeah, it's absolutely the whole shooting match. Who do you think might be interested, Pete? Close to your heart, my friend. Oh, for, I, for, I for wouldn't be surprised. Uh, well, I've I remember saying a couple of years ago, I thought where Breitling wanted to move up and they wanted to do more stuff in movement. So I always thought the smart thing to do was just buy someone mm -hmm. um, rather than do it yourself. And yep. so, and think about that, this, Pete. That would make. I thought they were only selling Parmigiani the name, though. I thought Festiva were keeping the rest of or Fest, Is it Festina? Were keeping no, the it's, the, it's, the, it's the family. It's, it's, it's an investor. Oh, the family. It's, a, it's, a private, yeah. it's a foundation family that won, yeah. that basically, by all accounts, won out for whatever reason. But uh, that, think that about what make... brand. What brand have Breitling acquired recently that they're going to oh, invest yeah. in the next few years? It, and what does, what does that movement manufacturer specialize in? Micro yeah. rotors. Micro rotors. Oh, yeah, that would, I, I, in, to be honest, when I'm sitting down and playing my little, if I was the CEO game and I heard Parmigiani were on the market, my immediate thought was, if you've got a hundred million bucks, just go buy them. Um, 
But wow. Parmesan with that movement technology and the, the, the industrial base behind it, which would suit them down to the T. And if you took exactly. a Parmesan and rebranded it, what could that suddenly become? That becomes wow. a yeah. universal Geneve. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I, wow. There's, that would be what I go back a couple of years before they'd bought UG. You know, I thought the smart move for someone like Breitling was just go buy Concepto. Um, they went in a different way. They bought a brand, but I would still go with the just buy your movement maker. Mm. I mean, they, Rolex the, just, they Rolex bought the just, brand. They bought the brand for a relative. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money in the industrial world. For I think what they paid I for UG. I think they got everything, and they got um, a bargain. It was a bargain. Yeah, they, got, really. they got everything that there was to get. Um, yeah. So they've got all the all the old IP, all the old patents. Um, there actually is they're, – they're never going to use it, but there actually is a modern UG micro-rotor movement um, that they made about four or five years ago. I think they got everything. Wow. And they got well, it. Considering what they got, They, it sounds like a lot of money, but it actually wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, that was a great point to end on. Any any final thoughts? That was a really oh, – I suppose it, it's a separate question and it's nothing and I don't expect it to go anywhere, but another question that people would to ponder in the George Kern interview with Hadinki, there was a hint, a clue that in the longer term, they were actually also thinking of buying a brand below um, Brightling to they do have, like a shooter to. thing. They yeah. have to. So, so then that creates a whole new game of who would you buy as your entry level brand? Mm-hmm. Well, we know it won't be Erebus from Jody, so we can cross that one off the list. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Let's go, just go down the list and cross them Christopher off. Ward, maybe Doxer. <laughs> yeah, could be. I don't Maniac. know. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, well, if 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 you'd have rewound the clock and a couple of years ago when they were desperately trying to find a buyer, I would have said Fortis. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's or a scary one down the bottom from So It Goes. Yeah, or Horace. Yeah. Nah. I don't I, I think they still want to be independent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I don't think it fits the vibe. No. I don't think it's it's no, it's not the vibe. And that's why I was thinking like Fortis kind of A, it was going cheap. You could have bought it for nothing if you were willing to pay the bills. Um and it kind of fits the vibe of the Brightling brand. It's yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, that can be a, that can be a comment for another day. If you were going to, fo- if you who would who would you pick for Brightling there? <laughs> cool. Well, that was a great show. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Thank you, everyone, for being so active in the comments section. And yeah, we'll see you next time on Casual Watch Talk Sunday. So, everyone, see you later. Bye, everyone.